each of you please you know introduce your your venture and what, and what each of you is doing there sure uh, thanks for the brief intro so Bilon is a Polish fintech company. We have 50 tech guys in Poland, and I'm the first international employee, so I'm based in the UK. I'm kind of a jack of all trades. As you know, with startups, you kind of have to do everything, so I'm mainly doing fundraising and sales, but also operations, some regulatory stuff as well. And I'm also an early investor in Bilon. Uh, my background is I started off my career as an M&A investment banker at Goldman Sachs. I then joined a hedge fund where I was a longshore equities investor at Citadel. I invested personally in Billon and kind of got very excited as to what they're doing. I heard they wanted to move to the UK, so I thought, you know, great opportunity to get involved. And I've been at Billon for a year now. Emilian. Okay, so I'm uh, Emilian. I'm CTO of Friendly Score. Basically, uh, what we are doing is just create scoring. Uh, but this is in alternative way. Uh, we started the journey three, three years ago, and during this time, we reach uh, customers from 70 uh, countries, and we start working with major credit bureaus worldwide. Uh, basically, right, right now we, we had the office in London in Mayfair uh, uh, with uh, people inside, and 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 second the office in Poland in Wrocław, where we have the IT team. So, like on the slide, the IT is in Poland. Uh, and basically, what we are trying to do is to help banks and credit bureaus for, for, for better credit uh, uh, assessments. Uh, and my background is I, I graduate uh, automatics and robotics in Wrocław. Paweł. Well, I'm entrepreneur turned investor, so I build the largest strategic communications firm. Uh, which in such ways to Europe, which had a pleasure to work at least with some of the people I could see in the audience. And uh, I sold it in uh, 2011, stayed for the earnout. And following the earnout, I managed a global corporate innovation program for ING, Life and Pensions, now National Netherlands again. And I moved to London. I invested in eight companies uh, personally. Um, two of them are here on the stage, so Villon and, and Coinfair. Um, and currently I'm building um, a retail accelerator and uh, an venture capital fund together with a, a very uh, fast-growing Polish business that's Sescom, who's ex um, they're servicing 31,000 stores across Europe. So we're going to build the accelerator and the VC here in London uh, to support and invest uh, technologies, changing retail, supporting retail. Um, uh, and we just uh, launched that, and I'm the, the co-founder and executive chairman. Sarah. Hello, everyone. My name is Sara Kosinska, and I'm running a company providing licensing a mobile app to financial institutions like banks, insurers, and asset managers uh, that helps millennials to start investing and do micro-investments. And we started working on, uh, on this company together with my co-founder, who is based in Singapore. Um, like a year and a half ago. And since then, we graduated from the biggest startup accelerator in Europe, Startup Bootcamp. Uh, prior to this, working at this company, I worked for Rocket Internet in Singapore. Um, I run my own B2B ventures in Poland, and I also worked for startups in, in Israel and in Malaysia. Go. Grant Blaisdell, I'm a co-founder and chief marketing officer of CoinFirm. Um, put it, boil it all down in a nutshell, uh, CoinFirm's core uh, platform and core period is, is pretty much using big data analytics uh, and our proprietary algorithms to structure actionable data for compliance for blockchain, whether that's transactions, entities, etc. But our platform's so comprehensive and, and such a big Frankenstein monster, if you want to call it, that you can, you can pull little parts off and create independent uh, solutions with that. So we also came out with a new solution recently for data provenance, uh, registration and verification. That's currently being piloted by two major financial institutions here in Europe and is being adopted by an insurance company. Um, our core platform has attracted anyone from big fours, global asset management companies, all the way to the other end of the spectrum in one of the biggest cryptocurrencies in the world, which is Dash, uh, which is a pretty historic thing. My, my personal background, I originally come out of this uh, California startup ecosystem, um, originally in new media. Uh, back to my buddy from Bilon's statement, I'm kind of a Swiss army knife in the company. So wherever something needs to get done, I'll plug that hole. 
Okay, guys, so we're gonna run, you know, the, the, the questions. So first of all, let me ask, you know, like quite specific question to each of the, each of the panelists, and then we, we're gonna move towards more general questions. So, Sarah, I mean, your application enables, you know, the uh, macro investments, automated micro investments. Um, right now, robo-investing is not so popular in Poland. Uh, what do you think? How, how you can make it more popular in Poland? That's one thing, and then maybe a little bit controversial question whether it can be at least as popular as traditional way of investing. Mm -hmm. So as my co-founder likes to say, we are RoboLite advisory. Um, and we are not really focusing uh, on the Polish market. And um, we are a Polish startup in a sense that the CEO is Polish and the developers are Polish. But the rest of the team is actually an Italian guy, British, Hungarian girl, and, and a Dutch guy. Uh, so we are a very international team. And uh, we indeed talk to clients in the Polish market and um, investments in general. Like Poland is not a big market for uh, retail uh, investing. Um, and with, with uh, what Robo Advisory allows for is to um, target um, first time investors. This is actually what we're doing. So our product uh, helps people who would like to start investing but don't have much capital, financial knowledge, and time. So how it works is that every time they make a card transaction, certain percentage between two and 20 goes into the investment account. And then the money is invested into a portfolio of low-cost funds, preferably ETFs, but ETFs are not popular in the Polish market. Um, and basically we have three risk profiles um, and our and our user get to start investing this way and gets to learn about investments this way. Okay. So let's move to let's move to Emilian. I mean, uh, social scoring, right? I mean, would it be possible to, to, to start, you know, the company like yours in Poland, knowing that in, at the beginning you had the problems there and you set up your company in the UK? Yes. Then you went through the long, long, long way of uh, sort of working on the on the on the company. And I heard that recently you are launching the first con contract with the first bank. So tell me more about it. Yes, so, so, so basically uh, the story be behind Friendly Score is that we wanted to just launch that in Poland and, and basically just operate only there. But, uh, but we uh, f uh, face a lot of issues, yes, with, with this company operating there. <laughs> so, so after moving to London, uh, and, and also get the mentoring from Startup Bootcamp, uh, basically we accelerate, yes. So, uh, of course, we, take the, we took the, the first investments from VC from Wrocław, uh, and this money helps us to just find the next investors and start operating here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but, but from here, it, it, it was much easier, yes. So basically right now, as I told you, uh, we have attraction in Poland, mm -hmm. so it's few, it's few big, uh, companies and we are in the latest stage with few banks. Uh, but basically, uh, right now we are operating in 17 countries, yes, which one is Poland. And uh, basically, uh, in Poland, there is few issues uh, with, uh, with, with uh, regulations, yes, mm -hmm. that uh, when we wanted to start selling in Poland, uh, it shows that the process, which is fully automatically, right now in France, score doesn't work, yes, because okay. in any way, we, we, we have to sign the real agreements with a lot of things that, uh, that companies who lend money need to need have some uh, protection to the uh, uh, regulator. Yes. But you succeeded, right? You're gonna sign your first. Yes. So so so, ba so basically, you know, you you need to know what is the law there. But uh, but I think that it will be really hard from from somebody who is not Polish to start selling in Poland this kind of product. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Let's build up on this <coughs> conversation about the regulators and uh, Matt. Um, I know that the rec Paul British regulator was more friendly towards Billon, and that was the reason why you started your, your sort of company in the UK. And, this, and please tell us more about Sandbox idea, how it worked for you in favor of, of your company. And later on, please elaborate more about you know, the Polish regulator, how do you see it now, and, and what was the lesson learned, and, and would you apply it now to the Polish you know, soil? Yeah, um, so I think I'll probably start with the fundamental differences between the two regulators. So they kind of have different philosophies. So I say the Polish regulator, they interpret all the laws quite, quite strictly and literally always, and they're also very prescriptive. 
So that means basically they, they'll look at all your processes, they'll say you can't do this, you can do that, you need to hire this person, you need to do that. So the upfront cost of kind of getting through the regulatory loopholes in Poland is much higher. So as a startup, we would have had to raise capital probably just specifically to get through the regulatory process in Poland. So the UK, the FCA on the other hand, is more of a governance focused regulator. So they'll say you need to have all the governance structures in place but you take responsibility, you take accountability, and when you fail, then we'll investigate a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, they've also started this sandbox program where they allow you to kind of start in a very restricted environment, and they will monitor what you're doing step by step, see where you're getting things wrong, so you need to do this, and you can evolve slowly in a very, in a very kind of interactive way with the regulator. And I think the Sandbox program is something that's actually really, really fantastic. We, we were a successful graduate of that program. And now we're actually speaking to regulators in a few different countries who are saying, you know, how did the FCA do this program? Um, and, you know, because they want to do it as well. And the regulatory environment, I think, is an overlooked but very significant either barrier or enabler of innovation. So I think if we were, if we just stayed in Poland and we were trying to go down the regulatory route there, we'd probably still be stuck in the process. Okay. We'd probably have less money. Whereas now in the UK, the process very smooth, very open, very helpful. And now we're thinking of passporting our license back into Europe. Okay. Now, you know, the KNF CEO seems to be more open, but let's see whether, you know, his words are turning into the real action. So let's see. Um, so... Uh, and they are also working on sandbox, right? Exactly, exactly. So let's see. I mean, we have, we have a pretty unique kind of insight in there just because our background is extremely focused on regulatory compliance. Mm -hmm. that's, that's obviously the, the issue that we're solving and addressing for the blockchain space. Our co-founder and CEO is the chairman of the Polish Compliance Association. We have access to any single regulator position you could want in Poland. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain reason why we're not taking it too seriously and investing a lot of time mm -hmm. into it. Uh, that should show you enough when, when, let's say, one of the premier regulatory experts in, in Central Europe, uh, who's a founder of a compliance association for the largest country in Central Europe, um, is choosing to dedicate his time and resources regulatory-wise in other jurisdictions. That should, that should uh, open people's eyes in, in, in Poland a little bit to, to uh, what are really the things that are holding back potential Polish fintechs uh, from not just succeeding locally, but in a certain global sense, like when you said in the Bilon sense, if they didn't have that that less diverse capability or approach, they'd be dead. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Already. Anyway, Grant, so let's talk about your case, I mean, sure. and the blockchain, right? So it, it, it seems to be that Polish banks are turning their attention to the attention to blockchain, but awareness of, of blockchain uh, per se, it's, it's rather low in Poland versus what we have in, in Western Europe. Do, do, do you think, I mean, can, can you comment on yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. Um, Pol Polish financial institutions and, and, and the industry, um, partially because it was behind and yeah, the, the fall of communism, it, it, got to, it got to begin itself at a more progressive step than mm -hmm. the rest of Western Europe or, or the United States, for example. So Poland started off ahead. And, and I think it's in a situation right now where it's getting a little bit too comfortable. Mm -hmm. They've kind of branded themselves as this progressive thing. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a few, a few things. Every, any major industry presentation I do to the financial industry, and I, we can do it right now. How many people here heard of blockchain? <laughs> Hands up. OK. How many of you are your companies currently using blockchain? Hands up. No. OK. So this is the response um, I get. I mean, there's two reasons for that. One is, number one reason Accenture did a study on mm -hmm. this is number reason, through our experience, number one reason <coughs> is regulatory compliance issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other one is, is more of a sales communication issue of here's a solution, here are the benefits, here's how you adopt it, go. It becomes this whole kind of discussion around blockchain and this guy, well, doesn't it come out of Bitcoin? And then you take them down this Bitcoin rabbit hole that you can never pull them or back. Or maybe you're just going to eliminate you know, banks as a sort of middleman, right? Listen, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not that utopian. I think they just have to change forms um, and they have to change their relationship with the client. Because um, here's the thing. 35, PwC just did this actually, 
35% of banks around the world know what blockchain is. 17% of banks in Poland know what blockchain exactly. is. Top 100 financial institution, <clears throat> institutions in the world are either investing in or adopting some sort of blockchain capabilities, solutions, technology, etc. cetera. Um, in Poland, I'm proud to say there's one, which is PKLBP, and that's because they're piloting our new okay. platform right there. Other than that, nothing. So um, I'm, a mar I'm not a marketing guy, but I'm a chief marketing officer. So I pay a lot of attention to what is, uh, sorry for, for lack of a better term, blowing smoke up people's asses and what's, what's a legitimate uh, approach. And for the most part on the financial market, even of those 100 institutions mm -hmm. who are doing some, most of them are blowing smoke up people's asses to make their shareholders happy, like we're innovative, et cetera. Most of it's branding. Uh, but it's, it's in their future interest, and anybody who hears in finance, it's in your future interest to take this seriously. Because if you don't, you're going to end up like the music industry about 15, 10, 15 years ago. Went through the same thing, were ignorant to it, the train came and hit them. So do you think that uh, Grzeg Grzegorz Pawlicki would be investing on behalf of Pika OBP in coin firm, or there is no chance? Or guys? You, got, you got to talk to Grzegorz. You okay. might know him a little bit better than me. But Grzegorz has been, uh, Grzegorz has been great. The PK OBP team has been, been, been really great. And you know we're coming to the market with a solution that can fit in any sort of corporate business process. Okay. So they saw the benefits. They're like, OK, we can implement this here. Here's the cases. That's how business has to be done in this blockchain space, because the crypto people kind of turned it into this quasi-ideological discussion, and, and that's not good for anyone's business. Okay, let's take the investor perspective. You know, Pavel, you, you put your money in, in, into Bilon and, 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 and CoinFirm. I mean, tell us your perspective, you know, your point of view, whether they can make it global, and then how we can sort of, you know, overcome these Polish obstacles. Yeah, so I think I invested because they are going global from day one. Mm -hmm. Because it just, you know, all companies are trying to, to be focused on technology. Technology is, should be competitive on the global scale. If you're starting from becoming profitable on the local market, like I'm absolutely 100% sure someone's going to be faster on much bigger markets. So, so you know, that's one, uh, that's one really important thing. The second thing is kind of value-add investors. And I think this is only starting in Poland. But... Um, but with, with CoinFirm, for example, or, or with Billon, in London, we raise, we're raising money from private individuals who are CTOs of big financial institutions, CTOs of successful fintechs. Um, in CoinFirm case, a global managing director of Citigroup responsible for compliance and market strategy, global head of AML of Thomson Reuters. Like insights from these people, uh, they, these are the kind of people, these are the kind of money that on early stage are moving us towards being uh, a global player who is successful. I think this is starting. So if you look at, at uh, M Accelerator that uh, Wojtek is going to be speaking uh, afterwards, their strategy is to invest like in all OECD countries and from like 100k euro to 12.5 million euro because they know that the innovation in the banking system will happen someplace. So they have insight, they are one, on one of the most innovative markets, but I want to use those insights to search best entrepreneurs. So I think you know, the whole kind of Polish focus um, is a little bit twisted. We have amazing talent, uh, but uh, the problem is that very often these talents focus on a very small market, which Poland is. And if you spend a lot of money, uh, struggle, etc., to win that market, you can be nearly sure that, that someone's gonna be there. And what I mean now building the, the, the air accelerator, this is the, the same kind of principle we have. So we're partnering with a great entrepreneur who built a very successful company that is listed on the Warsaw Stock Exchange, working across 30, with 31,000 stores across Europe. So they have insights from companies ranging from H&M and Zara, through reserve brands, uh, restaurants, banks, et cetera, et cetera. And we're taking these insights, we're taking this knowledge, ranging from kind of how difficult it is to technically implement something, or how much does it cost if uh, an AC fails, we can actually calculate you know, the, the daily loss in terms of revenue. And we're looking for startups that are actually solving that. And when we're looking at these companies, we're giving them two paths. But at some of these companies, we actually believe that they're going to become a great companies. So we want to help them taking equity. 
but some of them, they are really interesting new solutions, and we're happy to have some form of agreement where Sescom, our partner, will actually help to implement them in the, their clients' locations. Uh, and and we, we're using the insights we have from a Polish company that's operating on international level to help uh, companies from whatever they are, whether they are Polish or not. I think the last point is that it's very important that we have global investors in, in Poland. Uh, and by that I mean you might have heard about several very successful companies in fintech from Europe. You probably heard about Klarna, you probably heard about TransferWise. Well, I don't know if you realize that probably about half of the return from these companies will go to Sequoia Capital of Ander or Anderson Horowitz, an American LPs. So this is also a part where I think it's really important that in Poland you get a, a kind of a higher sense uh, and higher participation of kind of high net worth individuals, uh, managers, uh, and institutions to actually participate in the global level. Because if you invest in global companies, and let's say you build kind of R&D centers in Poland, the, the Polish talent could participate in this journey. And if you look at, for example, Swedish ecosystem, which from you know, a long history have a lot of global businesses like Ericsson, Skanska, et cetera, et cetera, they then developed the, the kind of tech ecosystem. These companies went global, and now they're building kind of new generation created by people who were early team members at Skype, at um, Klarna, and some other businesses. So you, init you initiated the discussion about you know what we have to do in Poland uh, uh, in order to, to, to help you know the, the fintech startups to, 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 to work globally to grow globally. So maybe beside you know financing and you mentioned and mentoring, right? What else, I mean, Matt, Emilian, and Sarah, would you, would you, would you like to have in Poland, to the, you know, when we are talking about the regulatory environment, et cetera, et cetera, what do you see that needs to be developed in order to make them successful, at least to help them, to support them? I definitely think those two are the key things. <coughs> Pardon me. But one problem which we found, which is a bit hard to define, was that Poland is a very siloed market in a lot of ways. So by that, I mean you have a big banking sector, an innovative banking sector, and some of these banks are owned by global banks, global leading banks. But the issue is these kind of Polish subsidiaries are normally very separate entities. So if you, you partner with a Polish bank, it's very hard to then go from being a Poland-based company globally. That's also another reason why Billon moved to the UK was because you get into the UK and you're kind of in the global headquarters of banks and corporations. Whereas Poland's just the other end of the extreme. It's a pure, pure local market. And I'm not sure I know how to answer that question, if it's a cultural thing, if it's a legal thing. But that was quite a big problem that we And it could be that you know, the well. Polish banks, uh, as we discussed before, you know, they are, they are sometimes not so international, right? So the client base does not support the growth, for instance. Right? Yeah. So you cannot simply plug in and then the benefit from the global. Uh, chain of the global database of clients. So, Emilian, what do you think? What's your opinion? Uh, so, from our perspective, it, it is much easier to talk to the uh, company which is l located in London, and later, for example, we are discussing that we will be operating in Poland, yes, in, in this company. So, so, basically, the decisions are made here, not in Poland, for, for most of the market. So, so, <coughs> so, if we are thinking about go to the market st st strategy, it, it is much better to be here. And, 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 to, and talk directly to the people who make the decision. And in case of the culture, uh, so I think that, uh, that, that, that everybody needs that uh, in case of mm, mentoring, yes. yes. So, 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 I, so I saw it, even in Wrocław when we organize some, some meeting for startups, there's a, a lot of people, yes. A lot of people are coming and asking very simple questions. Very simple. For, for example, how to find the first investor, or something like that. So, so, so basically, there are two problems. Yes, that the mentoring is very on poor level in Poland, and second problem is that the, that the decisions are not made there. Yes. So, so, so in any way, you have to go out of Poland to go back. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other ideas, Sarah? Needs? Or? Yeah. So you mentioned that um, KNF is communicating to startups that they are more open to innovations. And it would be great if um, the same communication was um, made to financial institutions. So they see that they, 
they get um, a sort of a green light to work with these innovative startups mm -hmm. on solutions that are perhaps not regulated in the Polish market at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because um, very often when we speak to our potential clients, they're like, okay, but what kind of is going to say about it? <laughs> I have something to add if I could. Yes, of course. Um, one of the reasons, I'm, I'm half Polish originally, my mother's from Warsaw, and, and about five years ago, one of the original reasons I, let's say, came back to Poland was because I saw a market with amazing tech talent, a predisposition of figuring out creative uh, solution, creative ways around things. We had this discussion a little bit earlier about it. Um, but there's, there's things lacking on both sides, and these two sides are A, from the investor side, and, and B, from the, the entrepreneur side. Um, the A part, uh, this is a European continental problem. It's, it's not as bad in Britain, but I'm, I'm spoiled because I come from a California ecosystem originally. But it's, it's about the risk, prof, uh, the risk acceptance of, of European uh, investors in the startups and what they're trying to pull out in the beginning. So I see a lot of activities. It's about terms of capital. Am I going to give you 500K seed and take 40% of your company, eliminate your equity space for future and global growth, <coughs> just so that I can feel a little bit more secure with my investment? Well, in reality, what you're doing is you're screwing yourself and you're screwing your startup by doing that. Um, so attitudes, attitudes from Polish investors and, and venture capital totally needs to change in Poland. Processes need to change in Poland. We turned down a Polish VC. Well, A, the terms weren't as good, but, but B, because they, their process was too long. We're a startup. We could die by the time you get your bureaucracy out of the way. And you know, Europe, Europe has, has a little bit more, of, is more predisposed to unnecessary bureaucracy. Um, on the flip side, uh, Polish entrepreneurs, first off, we're not a Polish company legally or culturally. We set our sides globally. 90% of our clients and partners are global. I advise a lot of startups in Poland, um, and, and no offense to, to Bilan over there, you're guilty of the same thing. You introduce yourself as a Polish fintech startup. No one gives a shit. It only hurts you to say that. And uh, the point is, is that Polish entrepreneurs need to have a little bit more balls and big vision because they'll spend eight months chasing down PKOBP on the local market and after that eight months, let's say they get a contract, which is not likely, but let's say they do. It's going to probably be another eight months bef before they see any revenue out of that. So what you got over a year and a half now, you're probably dead and you've totally ignored the rest of the world. That moves a lot faster. So I, I think it's a matter of both sides figuring out a little bit better balance of approach towards each other. It's, it's a mutual fault. I, you know, I'm the startup guy, so I'd love to throw it on the VCs and say it's, a, you know, it's all their fault. But it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural issue. And as a half Polish person, I understand the origins of that issue. But it's not an excuse anymore. It's been, it's been 26 years we can, you know. Get so out is, of is, it, is it getting even worse when you talk about the state or institutions such as PFR and CBIR who are going to support and putting money into the startup I, system? So. I, I upset, I think, once a Polish minister when, when I was asked my personal opinion on this. It's a very European approach towards yeah. it, what should be the most private solution in the world, mm -hmm. which yeah. is I'm going to take government stuff and throw it at a private issue. It, that doesn't work. But I think, yeah, uh, yeah but so, so there are some practical things that are here in the UK, and one of them are tax incentives that are actually limiting the risk that, um, um, that, that Grant mentioned. So, yes, Europeans are more um, afraid of taking risks, but uh, the UK tax system noticed that and said, okay, so you're going to have up to 80% um, of the, you can deduct up to 80% of an investment which was a loss from your tax. Like up to 80%. Like that is like nearly free money. Like either you are successful or you lose 20%. So this is a very pragmatic solution that, that is great because it's not sp spending free money which don't belong to anyone. It's spending your personal money. But we have a guarantee that, you know, if it fails, uh, you're going to... Um, you, you, you're going to have some um, huge part of recovery. So that's one, one thing. The second thing is also kind of a culture of kind of directness and kind of speaking about money uh, comfortably. So what, when, we, when we signed kind of investors to, to, to CoinFirm, um, it, it's usually in one or two meetings. It, it's we meet, we discuss, they like the solution, they have money. 
Um, and, and, and then, you know, there are some details figuring out the agreement. But basically, they say how much they're going to invest, et cetera, et cetera, not waiting for anyone. I'll give you a, a very concrete example from Poland. Um, so I met a great company in Poland. Um, if, if any of you are interested in, in fintech investment, you, you, you should talk to the founder. It's called Exchanger. Um, <clears throat> I really like them. I really like their financials. Uh, I really like the founder. Uh, I'm not going to invest. Why? Because uh, they have two investors that gave them roughly 200,000 slotties for like 20%, and they're not putting additional money uh, in the next round. They're not helping to raise. And I'm telling them, look, if I would persuade, I really think this is a potentially global company, but, but my take to the founder is, like, if I would persuade my friends or people who I trust or who I know would be valuable investors, like, how would you, how would you see the dynamic around the table? Like, we new investors have, let's say, you know, 5 8% whatsoever, and there are Two investors guys. who have 24% <laughs> that are doing next to nothing. Uh, how do you think, what's going to be the chemistry? How, how will we do whatever? Advisory board meetings, what, any discussion. And let's say you're going to risk and um, something will go wrong. And the product is still good, you're still having good numbers, but you need to raise again. And we are happy to put some more money because we believe in the company, because we want you to be in position to succeed with a great VC round. But these guys, again, they say they're not going to invest. So, 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 you know, so, so I'm, I'm not going to spend, spend time on that. And again, I think what, what, when we did the launch of, of our, our accelerator here, like uh, uh, on Monday, uh, the, the maturity of the companies that, that met us, the startups, uh, was, was completely different. Like there were a number of companies that raised like million, two million pounds from mostly private investors who are value-add investors who know the retail space. They are founders of retail businesses. They are managers of retail businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. Like, if we're going to partner with Polish companies, like, let's say, LPP, CCC, they don't give a shit whether the company they're working with is from Poland or not. If this company will help them to save X amount of money uh, in every store or um, help to, to increase the margin or you know, conversions in e-commerce or omni-channel, they don't give a shit from the co if the company is from Poland or not. And, and I think it's, it's really important to kind of have this uh, uh, international attitude from, from very beginning. Uh, because also here, when people invest their private money, the motivation to help is great. So we're openly saying like, look, we'd love your skill set. We'd love to use you as advisor. But it's not going to work if we have four or three investors uh, who, um, who paid their money and they're giving us their time. So either you invest. Uh, and then we're happy if that works to figure out either a non-executive role or advisory role where we'd actually pay you some money back for, for, for some more kind of contractually formalized role. <coughs> but it's not going to work if you're not going to invest in the first place. So, um, so I think this conversation, uh, I would not even try to have them in Poland because I, I feel that it's a okay. lot of time. Let's talk about you know, some opportunities because we know that Polish banks are a quite innovative in terms of uh, in terms of you know competing with the fintechs right or supporting fintechs or two they're obviously local so they don't have a global client base right but on the other hand uh, could you please uh, Mart, Emilia and Sarah uh, elaborate more about the opportunities right because when we we know that Polish banks are very innovative but it's not the same, for instance, in the UK or some other countries. So, is it any? Is it? Can we have it? Can we talk about it as an opportunity for you guys? Or, or, or? yeah, I mean, I think it's two sides of the coin. One is, you know, sometimes the Polish market is a bit local, yeah. but on the other side of the coin, things can move fairly quickly there. So, we found speaking to some global banks in the UK, there's a lot of committees, a lot of processes, a lot of compliance work up front, whereas in Poland. There's more, you know, if there's sort of the lead manager likes your solution, things can get implemented quite fast. So we have two banking partners in Poland. We have Plus Bank and very shortly we'll have Alior. And those processes were actually quite quick. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they're, they're local banks, so we can't use their solution globally. But we think that's a very impressive speed mm -hmm. for a bank to move at. So. Uh, we do see opportunity in dealing with um, working with Polish banks 
I mean Polish in the sense that it's a Polish branch of an international bank more than a Polish bank. Um, like last week we won an award uh, for the most promising startup of BNP Paribas. Um, so we hope that the fact that it, it's easier for us to uh, get a deal done with uh, a Polish bank than an international bank yeah, will help us to expand to other branches of international mm -hmm. bank um, based in Poland. And of course there are banks like ING that prefer to build everything in-house but there are also other banks that um, that are more open for working with startups. Mm -hmm. Okay, Emilia? Y yes, I can confirm that uh, I, th I think that right now Poland is very interesting in case of fintech because uh, these few banks open just uh, these funds to invest into the startup, but, but also uh, the people who are, who are in banks uh, in, the in, in the top uh, management and uh, risk people, beca because I am dealing with uh, risk people, they really like to implement new solutions, yes? So, but uh, the, the only things that we are forcing and in few banks are the regulations, yes? So, so, we are, so we are thinking about if we can do some stuff, because as I, uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so basically we are doing case coding, so this is the heart of the bank, yes, and uh, there, there is a lot of problems with, with implementing that. And for example, in, in, in the Western Europe, there is no problem. Yes, it's very easy. It's, it's very smoothly. Oh, and, uh, to to yeah, I think there, there's one fundamental difference between dealing with uh, financial institutions here and in Poland, which is that, for example, um, with CoinFirm again, when we're starting to work on an implementation with a, with a bank, we'll take approximately 50,000 pounds, maybe more, for like several weeks scoping phase. And in Poland, we would be dragged to like 16 meetings for free to educate everyone about what we want to do. And, and you know, th this, would, this would be absolutely natural here. Like there would be no discussion. People totally understand that you just have to pay this money mm -hmm. because it's work. And 50,000 pounds is probably, you know, annual margin from that, that a fintech would get from a corporation with bank with a kind of full rollout. So, so I think, you know, it's also the, the scale just, you know, comes back at you. Can, a Pol Polish market cannibalizes its own standards. Mm -hmm. My, uh, I, I come out of the creative field, new, <coughs> new media field originally. And, and what the Polish scene has done to itself in that, it's everyone undercutting everyone else constantly and no one's setting a bar and being like, no, this is how much respect I have for myself. Like, if you don't like it, just then fuck off. Because it's, it's gotten so bad and, and Pavel brought that point up. You know, you spend, you spend 50 cumulative hours dealing with a, a partner and they have a budget set aside for a pilot. All that work, and they give you back pretty much less for what it's worth just to do the pilot, right? And you say, okay, 50K. Dealing with Western Europe and dealing with the United States, they understand you got to pay to play. And in Poland, it's still very much this thing, and I understand it culturally, where it comes from, et cetera, but it's still very much this thing. I'm going to find out my ways around so I can give you as little as humanly possible. And good relationships, long-term uh, vision, uh, really collaborations and partnerships that build something great aren't built on that. I would say that it's more of an Eastern European thing than a Polish thing because mm -hmm. we also have experience yeah. in dealing with other Eastern That's European true. financial institutions. Yeah, and, st and based on not valuing their own time because here it's simply you can run a consulting project with BCG or any other consultancy for that matter, also Deloitte, and then you might just do a test. You might just take the product, plan a test, and have result, and iterate three or four times. And I can assure you that this is going to answer more strategic questions you have. And I also think that, that um, from what I hear, organizations like Deloitte are also trying to persuade their clients to kind of have this kind of testing attitude. If you do your own company, if you, if you know the kind of lean startup methodology, it's all about kind of putting a product out there and just testing it and iterating. And this, this is the same thing we, we want to do um, at our program, that we'll, once recruiting the, the startups to a cohort of the accelerator, we're already going to have implementations in mind. And if you think about payments, in, let's say payments innovation, we want to have a bank, we want to have a payment processor, we want to have you know, Visa, MasterCard, and we want to have retailers. And we want to put them in one room 
uh, potentially with several you know, creative people like consultants, etc., and let them discuss like which startups fit, which, which, what is the right proposition. And we hope that after several sessions like that, they will come out of the room uh, with real plans for implementations. And um, it would not include spending tons of money for kind of strategic sessions, et cetera, et cetera. And it would be very pragmatic and kind of cost saving in terms of time of all parties involved. And yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's the approach that's not yet present on, on the policy. I, I, don't, I don't get a yearly salary. I'm, you know, I'm a co-founder. So when I'm talking to some guy you know, from a big corporate who gets a yearly salary, who really he really doesn't. The more time he spends in a meeting like that, he's probably happier. And for me, and for me, like, dude, I got stuff to do. Okay. So, so it's a matter of respect, mutual respect, let's say. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. And thank thank you, you, the audience, for, for all the